Welcome to the Tea with Tamara podcast. I'm Tamara Arnold. And it wasn't that long ago that I was a broke single mom drinking way too much, completely detached from everything. Now I've written multiple books, downloaded I Could Read Chakras, and I'm a channel for the universe. I'm a real person with real stories, and I can't wait to share them with you. So grab a warm bevy and let's have some enlightened conversation to live our best life. Good morning, magical beings. I am so excited about Tea with Tamara and Amy Neal today. I met Amy when she joined the Chakra Business Academy, and immediately there was a connection, and she began supporting me without even knowing it in how I can utilize my my furry companions, my two dogs, in my meditation practice. And so when the opportunity came to introduce her to you all, I absolutely jumped on the chance. So grab your warm beverage, whether it's coffee, tea, hot water with lemon, sit back and really truly allow what we talk about today to transform the relationship that you have with your pet. Hey everybody, I just, I am so excited to have Amy Neal with me today. I was introduced to Amy because she joined the Shocker Business Academy and we started communicating in Insta stories and, you know, she was asking me about meditating with my dogs and I was like, oh, I didn't even notice if I was meditating with my dogs and what is this thing she's talking about? I just wanted to know more. And so I am excited to be able to have this conversation because ever since this, and you don't know this, Amy, um, my Peter, because you know who Peter is, often will just place one paw in my left hand when I am meditating, which is the uh, receive hand, right? And so we like because of you, I am more aware and more conscious of where my, my animals are around me in my space when I am you know, of that frequency. So in gratitude, I'm so excited to have you here. And just to introduce yourself to uh, the people listening and the viewers, please just kind of give it a, hey, I'm Amy, this is me introduction. Yeah, hey, I'm Amy. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm a canine intuitive. I help dog moms specifically, but dog owners in general, see their dog not as just a furry companion, but as a catalyst for personal growth and a catalyst for reawakening the dreams that we've shut down because of societal beliefs over many years of life. So I am here to teach people that your dog came into your life to reawaken those dreams and you can achieve anything you want. So that is so cool, first and foremost, and such a big statement and so powerful. And it like leaves me wanting to go right back to the beginning of your story. But like, did you always have a dog? And if you did have a dog, did you always know you were intuitive with your dog? And like, that's kind of like what I want to do. So let's start a little bit back further into like, what got you into this? Where were you? How did this all begin? Yeah. So, I mean, it goes, it goes all the way back. Um, we didn't always have a dog, um, but we got our first dog when we were in second, when I was in second grade. And I always joked, you know, after the fact, after our dog had transitioned that mom, what were you guys thinking? Our first dog, a Dalmatian or a Cocker Spaniel, those were our choices. Like not easy first dogs. And we got, we ended up getting a Dalmatian. We loved her to pieces, had her for 16 years. She was not an easy dog. She was dog reactive, and I would err on the side of dog aggressive. Um, Like, I remember my aunt would want to bring her happy-go-lucky lab over when we had family gatherings, and my mom would be like, no, you cannot. You need to leave the dog at home. Our dog will eat your dog. (laughs) And it, so just so people who don't have animals or don't know what dog resistant and dog aggressive is, it's just like uh, territorial, going to protect my human, that kind of thing. Yeah. And think of it as in the concept of like a hum- human that is like, we don't want anyone to come near us on a really bad day. And if I'm having a really bad day and you try to come into my energy, I'm going to bite your head off. You know what I mean? So. When a dog is feeling aggressive or reactive towards 
another person or animal, they really are trying to control their space because either they don't want to be infringed upon or they're afraid. And not to get too off track, but that really comes down to root chakra, safety and security. First and foremost, if they're not feeling safe, they're going to react in a very dog centric way. because They don't have words. Um, so this is what we were living with. And we didn't know, but we're also not, and I don't want to like put ourselves in a category, but you know, we made a commitment to this dog. So even though she had her struggles, we just took it for what it was. We saw her for what she was and just didn't give it much weight. It was just like, no, don't bring your dog because our dog doesn't like other dogs. And it's just how we did it. And ultimately she ended up, let's see, I was in fifth grade. She ended up biting me. Um, and that was a really profound moment, and I didn't realize it at that, you know, when you're in fifth grade, you don't realize. But reflecting back on it now, in this day and age, like, after a dog bites someone, you have that limbo of, oh my gosh, what do we do with this dog? And it's the decision-making process of, do we euthanize the dog, do we give up the dog, or do we see it through and solve the problem? And I remember in a split second going, we cannot give up this dog. This dog is my life. This dog is my best friend. And I, I created this scenario. And my mom was freaking out because I was bleeding down my face because she bit me right next to my eye. And my dad was just trying to control the bleeding and you just control the chaos of my emotions, my mother's emotions, the dog's emotions, and his own, but still be rooted in that dad energy, you know? And I knew that I had to act really quick. And so I said, don't, I, I remember saying, like, don't blame the dog. Don't be mad at the dog. She was asleep. I laid on top of her. I was just trying to cuddle with her. It's not her fault. She's not the type, because I, I knew she was not the type of dog to lash out at a human unless put in a situation where she felt she had to. And to have that thought process so quickly as a 10-year-old is like, I think back on it and I remove myself from it, you know, and observe it. And I'm like, wow, that's some deep stuff. <laughs> is deep stuff, right? Because like in truth, the majority of people, because I've known a lot of people who have been bit by dogs, that's the moment that they become afraid of dogs. That's the moment that, you know what I mean? They do get rid of the dog or something happens that leaves abandonment, it leaves sadness, it leaves all of these other emotions. And here you are bleeding down your face and your first concern is not about your own human self. It's about, what was your dog's name? Penny. Penny? Yeah. That's yep. so so it was about Penny. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it was... And here's the cool thing. She never had an incident with a human ever again. And if you ask my childhood friends, they love her. Like, she would come up in our room, she'd hang out, she'd be on the bed. And we had... She and I had our own little ritual. Cause I loved her so, just so much, like with my whole heart. I'm getting emotional now. <laughs> um, every night from when she was able to have free run of the house till the day that I left for college, we'd go to bed. I'd finish my homework and I'd go get her out of her chair. She had her own recliner. And I'd say, come on, Penny, it's time for bed. And we'd go up. She she knew. We'd go up to my bedroom, and I'd climb in, and she'd climb in, and she'd go and burrow under the covers, and then she'd come up, and she'd put her, help, her head on my pillow, and we'd spoon, and we'd fall asleep. 
And then when I left for college, my dad would always tell me, because I'd be like, how's Penny? I miss her. Is she good? And, woo, Tamara, the places you're taking me today. Um, she got really confused about where I went. Holy cow. <laughs> and her routine was to look for me to go to bed. And I wasn't there. And so my dad would tell me how he would have to run her through the routine. And at this point, she was at like 11. And she lived to be 16. So I had that dog through all the big stuff yeah wow. <laughs> um so let's just stop here and honor the emotion for a second because i think that that's really powerful and a true testament Amy, to your stardust right and yeah. doing what it is that you were placed on this earth to do and believe me guys i'm holding it together by a thread right now <laughs> it's like the emotion that i feel from from you Amy is so great and the love for Penny and but I do have this visual that your dad did your dad get into your bed and allow Penny to get into the bed too as the routine or did he just help her very very similar he would um bring her upstairs because I think like the vision that I get he didn't really give me a lot of details but I feel like she would pace like she didn't know where to go like she was confused about which bed to choose. And so he would take her and guide her in to my room and he'd tuck her in. Oh. Yeah. And then that's that would be when she could relax and fall asleep. And as to, because we're both mums here on the same level, like I have to say when you have an empty nest and your child goes off to college, how profound is that from a parent standpoint to be still able to tuck in into your bed you know your fur baby or your your part of you as well i just see it from both sides here as being a really special relationship that your dad and penny then got to have yeah she had it's so interesting because like she had a very her, she had her own relationship with my dad she had a different unique relationship with me she had a unique relationship with my mom she would sit at the edge of the rug, the living room rug in the kitchen threshold, and stare at the door every night and whine for my mom to get home from work. And just wait. And just wait. <laughs> and then she would sit next to my mom when she was doing her lesson plans or computer work after dinner and paw at her. You know, and, you know, looking back now, that's my sign of your dog is asking you to be more present in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, close the computer, pet your dog, or if you have pressing work to do, invite your dog up to sit with you. The dog wasn't allowed on the furniture. Right. My mom would just carry on and give a little pat on the head and <laughs> carry on. Um, but that, you know, when we, for a while, we ragged on my mom that, you know, oh, mom, you ignore that dog, this and that. And it was, you know, it wasn't just a lighthearted joke, but really deeply if your dog is doing that they're asking you to to slow down a little bit and to to come well, into the moment like even the way that you define it is it's so similar to our real children too like on, a, on some level right like the energy is not any different they're both seeking our our attention and our love and our affection and our care and our awareness and and all of these beautiful exchanges that happen and <laughs> so because i can't help it Amy, I can't help but refer to my own dogs, right? And so, like, I can see the time that I personally have done that. And now I am in the conscious awareness, though, of being in the present moment each and every single day. So taking that when they're jumping on me to be like, okay, the the book that I'm writing can wait. I can give them, like, a good morning. How are you? Like, yes. <laughs> oh, like, whatever, so that they can... And, like, not be like, ah, why are you on me again? Like, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. Like, for me, we have hounds, right? So they bark a lot. And they tend to bark when I'm not present in the moment. And that happened to me yesterday. They were just barking and carrying on and being restless. And I was like, oh, you guys, please be quiet. 
right? But the reality is I had just gotten off two really deep, really deep coaching calls. One for my own mastermind crew and one was my own personal one-on-one coach or call with my own coach. And we moved so much energy and I thought that I was slowing down to process it, but I wasn't. I was still doing things rather than just sitting down on the couch and just doing nothing for like 20 minutes. And once I acknowledged them and was like, oh, okay, I hear you, message received, that's when they shift out of that craziness. So, yeah. It's so true. It's so true. Like, in, in since meeting you, I'm more aware of what go, goes on. But I do want to go back to the fact that, so you are out of college now when Penny passes. Mm-hmm. When you were going through that process, did you get your own animal, or did, did you not start any of your own personal experiences with your own animals until after? I didn't um, get my own dog, but my sister did. And I, so my sister's 10 years older than me. So when I was graduating college, she was 31. So it was much more acceptable for her to get a dog. I don't think I could have handled having a dog on my own at 22. Um, Or at that, no, no. But it was funny, a year later, yeah, a year later, two years later, I did end up getting my own dog. Um, So my sister got a dog. Everybody told her not to. Her husband was overseas playing basketball. Um, She had just torn her ACL. She had ACL surgery. It was the middle of January. She owned, at that point, I don't know, she's in property management along with teaching. So she was managing an apartment house that I was living in, plus another house. And we were like, don't do it. But the reality is, she really needed that companionship. And that dog, because uh, he's still around, he is so in, I've never seen a dog so aligned with a human's emotions and physical well-being as that dog. When she's having a bad day, when she's not feeling well, when she's, because she's got some chronic pain, when she's just having one of those days and she's on the couch, he comes up and puts his head right on her head. And he has been like that since the day she brought him home. What kind of dog is that? He's a Springer Spaniel. And he's just, he's so much fun. He's so much fun. And so... Everybody was telling her not to, and she called me up and was like, "Um, I did a thing, and I I did a thing, and I was like, I know the thing you did. We need to go get lunch. So we went out for lunch, and over margaritas, I was like, so, did you buy the dog? Did you get the dog? Where's the dog? And she's like, there was another couple that was looking at the dog, because at this point, we didn't know much, so she had gotten him from a pet store, and it was kind of like, you know, it was an adorable dog at a pet store, but the way I look at it, it's like we rescued him, because nobody was buying this dog. Nobody, everybody was overlooking this dog, and then she saw this couple going to put a deposit down, or looking at the dog, and she was like, that's my dog. Like, she went to visit him every day at the pet store. We named him. And I was like, I remember telling my friends, I was like, I'm just waiting for the stars to align. This dog is coming home. This dog is going to become my sister's and we're going to have so much fun with this dog. And so we're sitting over margaritas and I'm like, well, you know what you have to do now, right? And she's like, what? I was like, you have to go buy the dog. This is your dog. You can't not ignore the fact that this is your dog. I have to go get the dog. So she says um, to me, she's like, well, we got to hurry because Aunt Betty drives right past the store at, in about an hour. And if she sees us there, we're going to be in such trouble. And I was like, well, then let's go. Let's go right now. Sure enough, we're checking out. She's signing the credit card slip and in walks my aunt. 
what are you doing? We're like, nothing, nothing. We have to go. <laughs> My uncle's behind her going, yeah, you've got the dog. That's so funny. And that, so Baxter, her dog, he's a dog that really sparked my interest in training. I went to her for his puppy classes and, you know, we got all the toys for him and we did the, I mean, we really wanted a dog that was just happy-go-lucky and could be off leash and responded well. And, like, to say that we manifested that or that she manifested that would be not telling the truth because she manifested that. Like, she called this dog in, and it was a most beautifully aligned process. So, so he, he was a dog that sparked my interest. And oh. no, no, I have like a hundred questions. So you just keep talking. <laughs> I have my never locking in questions. <laughs> so, um, it was about a year later. I went off. I graduated college at that point, and I went off to Columbia University, and I was coaching track. And I was there for indoor season and outdoor season. And I remember coming home at Christmas break going, uh, Mom, I think I want to train dogs. I don't think I want to coach track anymore. Right? I was one year out of college. I walked into a Division One track and field coaching role. And I'm sitting at the dinner table looking at dog training schools with my mother. like. To say something wasn't aligned in the career path that I was choosing, <laughs> mm, here's your sign. So flash forward through that year, I met my now husband. And that spring, I told the coaching staff I wasn't going to be returning. I was going to go live on a farm with my boyfriend. And we we're going to move to the country. And they looked at me like I had 10,000 heads because it's New York City. And that's like the furthest thing from reality to these people. And I got an email from one of the coaches after I had moved back home saying, you know, like having a coach as young as you come through the pipeline with as much talent and awareness and ability to pull the talent out of these student athletes. He was like, that doesn't come along very often. Why are you giving this up? And I was like, I totally appreciate it. And I, it, like, the decision tore me up, but I followed my heart. And then so I went and moved in with my boyfriend, who's now, my now husband. And he said, I want a dog. I said, awesome, me too. What kind of dog do you want? Let's get a lab, right? Because I'm thinking, had a hard dog. Let's get an easy dog. Let's have a happy dog. <laughs> He goes, I want a beagle. I went, you're flipping nuts. <laughs> I went, I don't want a beagle. They bark a lot. And the funniest thing was, when we were looking at my sister's dog, she was torn between getting a beagle and getting the Springer Spaniel. Now I have two beagles and a red tick coonhound. They're all howlers, are they not? Yes. <laughs> well, because even Peter, my little my little guy, is a dashing beagle. Mm -hmm. So he barks like a normal dashing, but then every once in a while he just gets Ooh. this Oh yeah, going on and I'm like, Oh wait, there's there's this little genetic and he's got like a really flat snout. He looks like actually in Beetlejuice, you know, where the 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 guy sprinkles the powder and their heads get smaller. Yeah. And their heads do not match their physical body. And that's my, that's what Peter looks like. And now everybody, if you're seeing me on Insta stories or you're watching anything and Peter's there, that is all you're going to see. We can't, he can't call her. We have to get a, like, even though we keep him in the regular yeah. uh, neck collar, we can't pull him because it pulls his collar off because his head's so much smaller than his physical body. That would be the beagle. Grr. It, it is. And he's on, like, and his, his, power position arms and, and things like yes, that. Yes, um, So, yeah, I said, you've got to be kidding me. You want a beagle. I don't want a dog that's going to be barking. And 
what do you think happened when I said, I don't want this? Of course, that's what you manifest. That's what I got. Yeah. So we go on Craigslist. Um, and I don't recommend, I don't recommend, number one, don't do what I do. Don't buy a dog from a pet store because nine times out of ten they come from a puppy mill. So my sister's dog is a puppy mill dog. And my dog, Rascal, who I'm about to tell you about, he is also a puppy mill dog. I didn't get him from a pet store, but the people that we got him from off Craigslist did. I need to interject you because some people who don't know what what a puppy mill is or why that that's bad. So can you just kind of give a little bit of information about that? Because I think that this is a really important conversation to have. So puppy mill dogs, they are, um, it's basically like a dog farm. So these dogs aren't well cared for. They're not loved. They live outside in really disgusting conditions. Um, you know, chicken wire bottoms on their crates and, you know, two foot by two foot and four foot by four foot kennels. And their only purpose in life that humans have given them is to reproduce for the sake of making money. So they're not honored as souls. They're not honored as individuals. Their physical life experience isn't honored and they're not kept clean they're not well fed they are often have diseases and not only that the genetics that are being passed down the pipeline are creating dogs like rascal who his barking is not normal like his level of barking for a beagle isn't normal and so that's how he got rehomed. So when we stop supporting puppy mills, we're really helping to keep dogs in homes because he went, so his story was he went from the puppy mill to a pet store to a kennel to a home that posted him on Craigslist for God knows who to come, you know, take home, you know, because they're not screaming, um, to my house. And if I hadn't been committed, look, com- committed to saying, you know, if my intention wasn't clear when I said I want a dog and no matter what, I'm keeping the dog forever. It's a commitment for me for the lifetime of this dog. I can almost guarantee you that if he had ended up in any other home, he would be rehomed. He would have been one of those dogs that would have been bounced around. Because that dog has pushed me to my limits and then some. It's How, old? How old is Rascal now? Eight now. Um... And he is a spinning image in dog form of my husband. He said, find me, a, find me a dog. And I said, okay, what breeders are we going to? He said, no, find me a free dog. And I went, that's a foreign concept to me, but I could get down with a rescue dog. What shelters are we going to go to? He went, no, Craigslist. And I was like, oh, okay, you're pushing my comfort zones here, but we'll give it a shot. So we did. And they wanted three hundred dollars for him, and they said, "We're like, oh no, we don't have, we don't have three hundred dollars. We're like twenty three years old. We don't have three hundred dollars to spend on a dog." And I hear the wife in the background go, "Just give him the dog." Turns out his barking was about to get this family of five evicted from their apartment. Oh wow! Yeah. Because he had separation anxiety. Um, we couldn't crate him. And the, the big story around Rascal is we were falling into a really codependent relationship with him. We were really feeding that separation anxiety. And I had no idea. Because I also had no idea how to curb it. Other than stuff him in this crate and let him bark. And I was like, that feels really mean. Because he really can't handle it. So then, um, you know, I had my Mack truck event with him. 
and I ran him over by accident. Um, he was up tied out at the garage at our farm and my husband was working on some tractors and I had just driven up there with the car and I was getting ready to leave. I checked all the windows, all the mirrors and I was like, okay, I don't see him. So I started pulling out of the driveway. I mean, we're in a gravel dirt driveway. I'm going like 10 miles an hour and I hear the thud. And I look in my rear view mirror and I just see my husband like arms up in the air, just flailing, like grabbing his hat and throwing it on the ground. And I'm like, I just ran my dog over. I just ran my dog over. So a broken hip later and no money for surgery, we ended up crating him for eight weeks. So he had no choice but to get used to that crate. So the universe was like, this is, there, you know, the universe dropped a sign that your sole purpose is to open up and expand into dog training. Here's your first event because you're ignoring all of the other signs. And I also was just out of the blue offered a job at a dog boarding facility at this same time. And it was a grooming and boarding facility. And I ended up, you know, being the person that when they, when the owners couldn't be there, I would go and do all the let outs and the feeding and, and all that stuff. And I loved it, but I wasn't owning the fact that it was my sole purpose and it was what I was supposed to be doing. And then even doing more with that. So we created him for eight weeks. And then once he healed, I was kind of like, oh, let me teach him some tricks. And we got a second dog in the middle of all that, which I also don't recommend. Um, Bella. And she's a Beagle Basset Hound mix. And she had her own set of issues. She was really shut down, really anxious. Anytime my husband would talk to her, she would pee. <laughs> yeah, she would just pee. Like if anybody came in the front door and greeted her, she would pee like a whole day's worth. Um, and it took me a long, it took her about two years to come around and break out of her shell. Um, and then, so that was really like the beginning of when we got our dogs and I, but I didn't really own the training aspect of it until the dogs were about four or five. And it was a, it's a me or the dog argument. The dogs, both of the beagles, um, had dug under the fence for like the millionth time. And I was done. I was done with that. And I looked at my husband and I said, this is not normal. I keep getting a nudge to take them to training. At this point, I don't care how you feel about it. It's happening. Or we're out. We need to stop resisting all the little signs. So we did that. And then I really got rooted in Caesar Milan and his... Like, you have to fulfill the dog's needs. You have to give them what they need and what they're desiring. And that was really the thought process that sort of cracked me open. And I didn't, I had no idea that I was cracking open at the time. I went, I have beagles and I'm trying to keep them in a fence. And I'm trying to keep them on a leash. And they're hunting dogs, and they're meant to be off-leash, and they're meant to be trusted, and they're meant to run out in front of me in wide open fields, and yet work with me congruently at the same time. How can I find alignment with that and still feel safe in that experience? Because um, I was realizing we would go out for an hour-long leash walk, and it wasn't enough was not touching their energy. So I did some research and I got into electronic collars, which they provide an electrical stimulation, um, not a shock before people like 
meltdown. Bombard this podcast with things. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So a little bit of background. There are really, really good quality callers that can give like a whisper or like a tap on the shoulder of like, hey, I'm talking to you. And then there's really bad quality callers that do give a shock. And those are the ones, they're the $60 callers. They have three settings. Don't touch them. I'm telling you right now, do not touch them. They're not what you want. They're not going to foster the relationship, the heart-centered experience out in nature that you're trying to achieve. So the collar that I use has 100 levels, and my dogs work on like a level two. I can't even feel it at that level. And so I was like, let me try this. We did some training with it. We like lots of treats involved, lots of really good happy stuff. And flash forward, we're five years into the process. I took a walk a couple of three weeks ago, maybe. And we're also moving. So, you know, it was kind of that, oh my gosh, this is the home where I empowered my dogs to be fully free in their physical body and broke out into my sole purpose on this land. And here we are taking an off-leash hike. And I'm not even using the remote. They're wearing the collars, but I'm not even using the tool because I don't have to anymore. And the joy and the gratitude and the alignment that was flowing through my body, the dogs were just totally in their element. There's something in me that when I see a dog out in nature sniffing and being free to do their natural things, it it fills me up. Because that's what they're meant to be doing, and we have to give them that opportunity intentionally. Otherwise, they're not going to get it. And so that's what cracked me open to realizing how big and expansive I can make my relationship with my dogs if I open up to the tools, the methods, and the opportunities that the universe has presented in front of me to build that dreamy relationship. To build that relationship when you go on Instagram and you see those gorgeous dog profiles and you're like, how do I get to be on that cliff with that background, you know, in a tent with my dog, it's no leash on it. Oh my gosh. That's how I created that for me. You're giving me hope by the way, Amy, because like my dogs are, when we, we, so we got Pete and he's got a really big backstory too, like a huge backstory. Um, cause we got him from a pound in Canada, but he came from the States and he was returned to the pound multiple times. He was a bit of a, like, he's an aggressive kisser. That's the only way I can explain him. Like, his form of kissing is, I think I want to bite your face off. <laughs> like, just nippy, happy, joyful, your nose is my, my what I want um, kind of thing. And he was older. So we were told he was three, and he's, but we've already defined that he is way older than what they told us. Um, and then there's Lily, who is just my chihuahua. Um, who I never had my own dog, by, by the way. I've never had my own dog. I got my own dog when I got Jeff, and he was an old, he only lasted like a couple years old, um, and he lived a bit, like to 16 ish. And uh, so I didn't really have a dog. I had a, a lump that wanted to sit in my lap because he loved me, right? Like that was not a dog. And so when I got Lily, who was a Chihuahua, that was my first dog experience. And so she's only three. But she has a lot of the things that you are mentioning, right? So if she's sleeping under a blanket beside me and Pete jumps up, she will attack him. Like, mm-hmm. it's like territorial, like all things. Recently, she's gotten to a place where she has become dog aggressive mm-hmm. um, with other dogs. So I, we used to be able to walk her and she would go and smell other dogs and want to run in circles and play. Um, but now she will get aggressive with them. Yeah. I tried to take it to a dog park. That was a big, big, I was just a big fucking mistake because that's really what I was one to say. Well, own it, sister. Own it. Right? So, like, when you're saying you had all of these issues with your with your uh, beagles, that you did take them to training at a later time. It wasn't like they started, as everybody assumes, is the correct path. 
yeah. um, that it's never too late to, to begin the process of training, no matter how old they are. It's never too late. They are eight and nine now, and I'm still working on new stuff with them because I'm still learning new things every day. And I, you know, my big question, my driving question, my influencing question for 2019 for myself and for all of you is how can I make my training experience with my dogs more joyful? And my answer right now is more treats. <laughs> because. So the treats really the answer, because we don't even use treats. <laughs> Amy, we don't even have treats in our house. Yes, yes. So everything in balance, right? The way that you rehab a dog in the basic, most concrete sense is, so let's take sit, for example. You ask your dog to sit, and they don't know sit yet. So you have to like, okay, they don't have language. I know what sit means, but they don't know what it means. You need to use that treat to entice them to choose that sit, to choose to put their body in that position. When they put their body in that position, you use what's called a marker. So you let them know that they've done exactly what you've asked. So I would, you know, shape the behavior and guide them into that sit. Then I would say, yes. Then I would give a treat and say, good job. Good job. And that's how you create new behaviors. And the other thing that you can do is you can use that for like desensitizing, right? So baby steps. So when Rascal's barking, he's barking at me, barking at me, barking at me because he knows I have treats in my hand. I'm not giving that treat until he's quiet for two seconds. So he's got to be quiet for two seconds, and then I go, yes, good boy, and I give him the treat. Now, that's the training aspect. That's like 10% of the whole relationship. So a download that I got today was influence and engagement versus coercion and correction. So my training methodology holds a very balanced approach. So I believe that when our dogs are doing something that we don't like, like barking, <laughs> we can correct them. But we also have to, like we can tell them no in a way that a dog understands. So if I create a booming voice and yell, no, don't bark. Number one, there's a whole lot of frustration behind there. So you're out of alignment to begin with. So law of attraction is working against you. So it's going to just make that behavior even bigger and more frustrating. Or I could put a leash on my dog and work on some sits, right, to break it, break that up. Or I could put a training collar on him and give him a correction for barking. And then when he's quiet, I could give him a treat. That type of thing. Or or before we even get there, I can tie into that dog's energy and say, take me to the root cause of this behavior. And I want to share a really, really important story um, about a rescue dog that came across my path last night. Uh, one of my girls in my mastermind, she's like, Amy. I've got this dog. He's in the local shelter. They don't have a lot of money. I've got to make a decision on whether or not he lives by Wednesday. And she said his behavior has gotten progressively worse and progressively worse and progressively worse. She said that a couple of weeks ago she could go up to his kennel and he was friendly and waggy tail. And now he's growling and being really aggressive and nobody can handle him. And so one thing I always tell my people is 
once you make that energetic exchange to work with me, you got me. Like you are my sister now. You are my friend. And especially in the mastermind group, like if something goes down like this and it's something that, you know, this is her sole purpose is to work with rescues and advocate for these dogs. But the process of tapping in was too big for her right now. So I said, I'll do it. I'll tap in, but I also want you to tap in and then we'll exchange what we've got. And the most powerful thing is being able to talk, connect and communicate with a dog like that and say, are you throwing this behavior because you're ready to transition? And they'll either give you a yes or a no. And if it's a yes, I'm ready to transition, no amount of training is going to save that dog. So I need to ask if you mean if the dog is ready to go to dog heaven. Is that what transition meant? Because yeah. I'm like, I'm having a hard time with that one. I was like, she's saying dog heaven. Because yeah, dog heaven. I don't even know if I can, I can handle this conversation when you say that either. It's dog heaven. And it's a hard one, right? Because we don't, we want to be able to save all the dogs. Um, but the coolest thing was when I tapped in and I asked him, I said, where's this behavior coming from? Are you doing this because you're ready to move on into spiritual life or you're ready to cross rainbow bridge? He said, no, I'm not ready. I'm throwing this behavior because I'm a product of my environment. He said, these are what all the people in this shelter are giving off. They're trying to control the really little mundane things for fear of not having enough money to control the big things. And, you know, not being nimble in that everyday structure. And um, so I was able to use my gifts to really strongly advocate for a dog in a way that not many dog trainers or shelters are advocating for dogs. Um, and that's influence and that's engagement. And this trainer now has a clear slate where she can go and you know, she's got a choice to make. Does she spring this dog from the shelter and take him home and rehab him? Or does she say it's too much for my physical plate as a human? Somebody else can either step up and advocate for him or I've got to walk away. See, I'm a human intuitive and I already know her answer. What's her and answer? I don't even know her. I'm not telling you. I'm not, I can't say the future. I will never say the future because the future doesn't exist. I see a potential opportunity. That's so her heart's too big. That's all I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. Well, that's in alignment with the conversation that we've been having. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's a, like, it's, I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this was her, this dog, even though it's not her personal dog, we both tapped in. She flexed her intuitive muscle for the very first time ever, 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 ever. And it was so deep and profound for her. It's not even her own personal dog. Right. This dog is going to expand her life in ways over the next six months that's going to blow her mind. And it's all stemming from really crappy behavior that nobody wants to deal with and can easily say it's just easier to discard this dog. I have to say one thing. The dog was hers before the bad behavior, too, <laughs> by the way. Like, the dog was always hers. <laughs> it's so true, right? It's like when we listen to Abraham and Hicks, it's like the money was always yours. Nobody gave you or loaned you the money. It was always yours. And I had, it's funny, I had that happen with another trainer friend with a dog in a similar scenario. And when I look at that dog, I go, that dog was always hers. She just didn't know it. But she didn't know it. Like, I can feel that she knew it. Like, and I'm not even in her energy. I can just read the, the situation yeah. and where her energy was in the situation. Oh, cool. I but, like, like I, I can feel her already, like, there before the bad behavior. That's why the bad behavior was so emotional for her and all of the rest of it, right? Because there was right. already... 
it vibrated so loudly for her. And that's why she was like, why is this getting worse? Because she wasn't aware. That was her, you know, she's had her own Mack truck. So for her, this was not a Mack truck. This was like a feather. <laughs> but it was, you know, she's coming into more aware and awareness of her own life path. And that's what dogs can do for us. And especially rescue dogs, another really big thing that we can do in the energetic realm is cut cords. Hey, everybody knows that's on, I forget which episode of Tea with Tamara I talk about. It's the brushing your teeth for empaths when I talk about cutting yes. cords. Are you telling us to cut cords with our dogs too? Cut cords with your dogs. You, like, so for me, I can see cords in dogs that are connecting them to their path. I can tap into emotion in them and see the cords happening. Like, I can see cords from a dog going from their chakras to specific emotions or specific behaviors. And when I cut those cords, it can make the training process that much more fluid. They can be that much more receptive to the training process. Um, I've only had two dogs where it didn't work. Um, and now my own dog is whining. Um, but one was, he was a severely aggressive bulldog, but one of his owners had just died. One of the parents in the house had just died. And the further that we got away from the, that death, the worse his behavior got. And we invested probably a solid six months with this dog. And I, that dog actually bit me. That's when I was like, okay, we need to have actually a really serious conversation about this dog's behavior because he's not getting better. Um, we decided to stick it out, stay the course, give him more time. And the family, after we stopped training together, they went off on their own journey. And I found out that a couple of months after they decided that they were going to euthanize him because it was wreaking havoc on their family life and when they let that dog go the peace and calm that came into their home was amazing they you know they're like we miss him we love him but it was absolutely the right choice and the girls in the house were empaths and they've seen that dog joyfully running through their home and, like, hanging out with their dad. Like, just their dad, like, their dad's spirit and the dog's spirit and just hanging out happy-go-lucky. He was throwing bad behavior. Because he wanted to go he wanted to, to dog heaven to play with his owner. Yeah. And the only other time um, I've personally worked with a dog whose behavior did not shift from cutting cords and energy work was a German shepherd who, when I tapped in, I said, are you ready to transition? Said, yes, I made a mistake. I was supposed to be a wolf, not a dog. Oh, I just got shivers. Yeah. And that was a dog that bounced around from house to house to house. But 99.9% .9 of the time we can cut these cores and align the chakras and we can tap in and do what I call spirit-led dog training, which is we can ask the dog, we can ask spirit, what does this dog in front of me need to heal this behavior? So then you've got the feminine and you've got the masculine coming together in the training process. Can I ask you to jump into Lily? Can you? Or do, like, I don't want to put you on the spot. Like, if somebody did, like, I would do it if I was on a call and somebody said, read my energy, I would read their energy. So I'm, not, yeah. I would, I'm only asking what I would do. So, like, if you... Can I just... Do you have a picture? Do you have pictures? Is it okay if it's on my phone and I yeah, hold it up? Let me, let me pull her up. She's... How about this one? This is her and I. Can, I, can it be me and her together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Me kissing her. <laughs> Let's see. Is that a good enough picture? Yeah. Okay. Oh my gosh, she's so little. She's so little. She's so <laughs> tiny. Plain size. But she's super happy. And she's sitting in front of me and she's like, ha, 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 ha. 
Look at me. Look at me. Yes. That is her personality. <laughs> Does she put a paw up at you? She, yeah, she face plants you with her, with her, with her paw. <laughs> she's she's like right in the face. Going, give me a high five. Would you just give me a high five and acknowledge me? And I'm going, yeah, hey. And she's doing backflips. Like, she's so happy that she's like, Thank you for connecting in. I keep trying to get mom to do it. She can do it, but she doesn't realize it. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> like, you're not just a human intuitive. Like, you're an intuitive in general. Ooh. Yeah. Like, when I said that, she was like, stop putting yourself in a box of your intuitive abilities. Listen, this isn't supposed to be about me here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's like my familiar. I love her. Yeah. It's funny. Familiar. She's like super quirky and super laughy. Laughy. Funny is that she was she was my do- my son's dog originally, and I I listened to your story when he was like eight nineteen eighteen or nineteen when he got her, and I picked her up from where she was born and brought her to him, and in that moment, her and I bonded, and it was. And within a short period of time, probably six months, and she was she she had moved in with me. Uh, okay, are you ready? Yeah. Can I drop this? It's kind of it's kind of heavy. There's nothing that I don't say on my podcast. Let's just drop okay. it like it's that. She's saying, "I was never his dog. I was always yours." But like the catalyst that your son has been in your life for all things, I had to go through him. For you to take me seriously and to bring you into your energy for even more good. Well, that makes me emotional. <laughs> you make me want to cry and so get shivers. And, like... and now I see her, like, you guys are under your blanket. She's curled up. You're doing your journaling. And she's like, my message. Like, she's like, I gave you my message. That's all I need to say. Now we can talk. We have uh, like we've just started the recent high five, but that's a thing. That's a thing since like with you, like like she smacks my face and I'll put my hand there instead, and so I'm just kind of like your hand. And your... Just give me a high five. Well, you will laugh about this because I guys, I was never a dog person. Please understand that. Like I've only had dogs in my life for like five years. I do not, and even anything in my face is a no. Anything is in my face is a no. So licking my face is a no, okay? Like, I, that is just a hard no for me. It will never not be a hard no for me. Um, so I've, I've been working with teaching her hugs because I'm totally cool if you want to throw your face all over my face as long as you don't <laughs> lick it. <laughs> and so that is, like, it's a funny thing. <laughs> you know, dogs do lick their butts and sometimes they eat poop and, you know, so I get it. I get it. My dogs are I'm like, don't come near my face. I love you. We can cuddle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Because I'm like, does that make me a bad dog owner if I don't want them to like stick their... And Lily is a ninja, right? So that I do end up with a, a tongue up the nostril or a French kiss sometimes or something you don't want, right? Like you're just like that. But like it does happen. That was really powerful, Amy. Thank you. You're welcome. She's a little shit. Just so you know, she jumps fences. She jumps into our neighbor's house. She's like, she's, you're not wrong. She has a super high energy. Like she, she, she has, she has the ability to jump on counters and like that. She has, not that she's figured out she can jump on a counter because I think she can, but on her tail, like she's flying. I call her the flying squirrel. So that ex- explains she was literally doing backflips and backflips and backflips and backflips. If I could train her that, then she probably would if she could figure that out. Does she like treats? Have you tried? We've never been treated, like, that's it. So I'm going to ask one question, because I think that this is an important question to ask as a, as a pet owner in general. Is there a preferred tr- treat to other treats? Like, how do we know what the right treat is? Like, I'm just like, yeah. like <laughs> super easy. Anything that says freeze, dried, beef liver, chicken liver, anything like that, because you know it's going to be quality. It's a one ingredient treat. You can get them on Amazon. Um, Stewart's is the big brand. You just type in Stewart's freeze dried beef. Um, 
they're not inexpensive. It's probably about $25, but that's for the big tub. Um, but they're quality treats and dogs love them. Love them. And that is amazing. So anything, to be honest, not to knock, like, do you guys have tractor supply up there? Okay. No. No. So anything that you find at Walmart, anything you find at the grocery store, anything you find, like, at your big box stores, stay away from, really, honestly. Because it's probably either made in China or, I gotta go there, because you ask, dog food, the dog food industry is not regulated. So when you see things on, the, like, your kibble ingredients list, like bone meal, chicken meal, um, fish meal, that's all scrapings off the factory floor. And that can include anything that's on that floor. We might get our food from the dog store, but we, we are very conscious. That's why I'm asking you this question, because I am conscious of what I'm placing in my dog. Like, I, I was a personal trainer for nine years. The human body is important. I'm not just going to ditch the, the, the furry population. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm not gonna call. Yeah. Right? So. so, and it's all, the other thing is, it's all based on your lifestyle. So, I'll be totally, totally open. We've fed raw for about two years. But now we've recently added a third dog. We added her back in April. And she's about double the size of our other two. So with two kids under four and three dogs, grocery shopping for our own family, for our own human family, is enough. Yeah. And then to get even more meat on top of it for the dogs, it's it's not that it's pricey. It's just that it's the process of remembering to add it onto the grocery list and then prepping it every day. Um, so we feed, we just switched back to kibble just because I said it's easier for me right now for where I'm at. But we went with taste of the wild. Um, stay away from Ein, stay away from Purina, stay away from blue buffalo. So many people think blue buffalo is a really good because their marketing is spot on. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Um, there's, if you go on Amazon, Stella and Chewy's is a freeze dried brand. Um, that's on the higher end of the price point. Um, you know, if I had one dog, one 30 pound dog, I'd be all over it. Um, a lot of the really top notch rescues that I networked with, they feed out Taste of the Wild, um, where they, for their personal dogs, feed raw. So Taste of the Wild, Wellness, from anything that you can get, like in the refrigerated section at your dog food stores that come in the rolls. But just check the ingredients. But, you know, you want to see organ meat. You want to see bone. You want to see uh, muscle meat. So kidney, liver, um, oh stomach but there's a there's a special word name for it and I can't remember. Digestive? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Digestive. No, what is it? It's uh... yeah. intestine? I'm just guessing. <laughs> it's like a really weird name and I can't remember and I always think it's fish. Um but then anything that you add on top of, like that's fresh is always a plus. So vegetables you can puree or steam lightly because they can't, dogs can't digest raw vegetables. They don't have the enzyme that we have in our mouth. Okay, so stop feeding my dogs raw carrots and lettuce, which they love. Just pop them in the microwave. We don't own a microwave because I don't believe in them. <laughs> pop them in the, on the stove top. All right. In the water for like five minutes. Okay. Or you could just. And then if I do it like a bunch of them, then I can, I can yeah. just have soft carrots from the fridge. Yeah. Batch cook. Batch. Cook. Boom. Boom. Done. Um, bananas. You just mash them up. They can have bananas, peas, blueberries, green beans, asparagus, avocado, um, grapes. Don't give them. Grapes are bad. 
Um, and no I'm chocolate, thinking, no grapes, no raisins, no, no raisins, no onion. Um, I know a lot of people that do garlic to keep um, like insects, like fleas and ticks and intestinal parasites down. Essential oils. Um, there's a big craze now using essential oils um, to keep. Ticks down. I don't know if you guys have ticks really bad up there. Like you do. We already are on a from the vet. We are we take care of all three because we live on a creek bed. So we go with we go with yeah. like they take yeah. they take their they they take their stuff because that's just the non option. That's just yeah, the and that's what you know. I was on this path of doing essential oils instead of you know the semester collar or the top or whatever. Um, but they're so bad here. She's like. You gotta do the Cerasco collar. You've got to. There's no other option. She's like, I right. wish I could tell you that essential oils. Were yeah, no, them. essential oils wouldn't work for my days too. Mm-hmm. But I do have to like say, Amy, it is such a delight to have uh, done this with you today and to share. And clearly, if people are listening and they might have behavioral dogs or something going on that they need assistance with, how would they find you? Where would they go? Yeah, they can go to my website, www.thecanineintuitive.com dot com. Um, that's my website. My Facebook is Amy Neal Canine Intuitive. No the, just Canine Intuitive. And then it's the same over on Instagram, Amy Neal underscore Canine Intuitive. And I love doing these some Instagram stories. Yay! And so I ask every guest, and this is so off the topic of dogs, but I ask every guest because I'm an avid reader and like the hugest book nerd in the land, and I don't know if you've listened to any of my podcasts and are prepared to answer this question. You are. She's shaking her head yes. Uh, To add to the book list that I am putting together, what is the most profound book that you have read that has influenced your life? Oh my gosh, there's so many. I know, but the first answer is the right answer for the people listening. I always say that, like, it's not about anything, but if you were to channel your intuitive things and think about the people that were listening and you heard a book right off the top of your head, what was it? Um, the Monks of New Ski, Let Dogs Be Dogs. Ooh. See? These are so cool. I love asking that question because I hear things and, and find out about books I never even had on my, my thing. Yeah. So, um, if you guys don't know about the Monks of New Ski, they're a, monastery here in Cambridge, New York. And they part of their spiritual life is they breed German shepherds. Hmm. So all of the monks have their own shepherd that they just live with. It's just their personal dog. They have a board and train program for dogs and they also sell puppies. But you know, the dogs are integrated in their daily life. And so they have a couple of books out and their latest one is Let Dogs Be Dogs. I just got shivers. That's so cool. Yeah. Well, I just did too. Um, my Facebook group, Zen Dog Online Owner Studio, a couple of weeks ago, I did an interview with one of the monks that does the dog training. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for, for, uh, joining us and sharing your gift with us today, Amy. That was so amazing. Thank you for having me. This was, it was so much fun. It makes me feel deep amounts of gratitude to be able to shift people's perceptions of their dog, to influence the way that you look at your dog just a little bit differently, like shining the flashlight. Well, there's a new tunnel to go down. Let's try that one. So cool. Love you, sister. Thank you, you so much.